So Janet get, has some great content for you today on order of construction, and we'll tell you about that in a minute. We're also, I think she said in the newsletter, we're going to show you some of our new flannels. Um, but we got a lot. What, 13? Yeah. 13 new? Mm, 14. 14. They're probably still good. Another one. <laughs> Um, I'm going to put the link to the flannels if you haven't already looked that, at them in the comments right now. Um, if there's one in particular that you want to see, uh, let us know at the end when we show them because we don't have time to show all of them. But if there's one that you want to see on camera or ask any questions about, um, let us know. But there's some really great options there. But first, we'll get started on our topic for today, which is order of construction. It is indeed. And I noticed that it piqued the interest of several people because we got emails. And, you know, in my newsletter, I almost always used to put Tuesdays at 2 Facebook Live. But I forgot to put Facebook Live on there. And several new people are joining us and so I got emails like, where is this uh, order of construction video? So um, hopefully we got a hold of everybody and let them know where to look for it. But, and also for those of you who are new, it will be housed right here on Facebook under videos in a chronological order. However, we also take most of these uh, Facebook Live Tuesdays at 2 and post them the following day or sooner on our YouTube channel. So that's YouTube uh, slash C slash Islander Sewing Systems. And once you're there, please subscribe. And that way you'll always know when we're getting some new things. And we'll, now that you're on Facebook, be sure to follow us, like us, and that way you'll also hear of anything that's going on and new. Okay, so we're gonna talk about order of construction. And this is a subject really near and dear to my heart because, as many of you may know, I started out uh, sewing young and I started out as a home sewer. So I learned all the same home sewing methods that most of you did or similar because they're not all the same as I find as I teach when someone comes up to me and says, oh, well, I was taught to do this. And then I go someplace else and somebody was taught a different way to do it. Sometimes there's more than one way to skin a cat, but sometimes one of, some of those ways are far more labor intensive, set you up for a more difficult process. And we all would like to avoid that. So I've noticed in basic pattern guides when I have an opportunity to use one, which isn't very often, but as I shared last week, when um, Jessica's daughter, Layla, was growing up, which well, is still growing up, she's only 10, but at two and three and four and five, I made her birthday dresses every year. So I would have my own little design in mind, but I would see a pattern that was similar. You know, remember, stop the insanity. So I would take that similar pattern, I only did this once or twice, and then adapt it to my design, do a little muslin, make sure it fit. But the biggest problem was the order of construction. One of the last things they did was put the zipper in. I'm thinking now I got a dress this big, this big around. And now I should have to put the zipper in after it's already been all sewn up. Ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Now, I don't know if they think that's the right way to do it or if they just made a mistake. But that happens a lot along with several other uh, order of construction hiccups. So I'm here to give you some tips on that. So one of the things that they teach in the garment factories and all professional workrooms is to sew on the flat as long as you possibly can. What does that mean? Keeping the garment flat, not sewing it up so it's cylindrical. Okay, so whether it's a dress or a shirt or a blouse, we want to keep it flat so we can lay everything out flat and apply top stitching and add pieces. So let's start with a shirt, for example. So 
You know that if you've been um, one of my customers or one of my students and purchased some of my patterns, I do things in what's called express order. And the only thing I do differently, other than I do follow this order of construction, but I may be sewing things in a different order, preparing them to be put onto the garment. That's a, another subject, and we can go into that another time. Or if you notice a pattern um, that you're interested in purchasing and it uses the term express, that's when you'll see what I'm talking about. It'll teach you the express method, which even speeds up construction a little bit faster. But this order of construction will help make it easier. You'll be picking less stitches, and it will speed up your, or, your uh, process. So let's say we're going to make a shirt. Well, and don't forget, in a lot of times it makes it look more professional. Well, that's true too, you know, especially if you're following the Islander uh, sewing systems construction techniques. But no matter what techniques you're following, the order of construction should be similar to what I'm going to say. So if we're going to do a shirt and it has any pockets on it, and that would include a jacket, any, any upper torso garment, it's got pockets, put the pockets on first. Prepare the pocket, put the pocket on first. So then with a shirt, the next thing I would do is create the plackets down the front. Now, these are two front pieces. They're not attached to anything. One or both may have a pocket on it right now, but they're completely independent, easy to work with, easy to fold back and press and top stitch or whatever you need to do to create those front plackets. And so then the next thing you want to do is put the yoke on the back and do your top stitching while that yoke is just on the back. So now you have a back with a yoke and you have your two front pieces, already got the pocket, already have the placket. Now you're going to put your shoulder seams in. And of course, we're going to do that burrito style. And those of you who have followed one of our shirt sew alongs know what I'm talking about. But if you haven't and you'd like to, go to the playlist and uh, pick up on one of the shirt sew alongs and you'll see. So, okay, now we have the shoulder seams in. This garment is still flat. You can lay it out completely flat, right? All right, so then the next thing we want to do is apply a sleeve. Now, if it's a long sleeve, you might want to go ahead and put that little placket down here. Put that on before you sew it to the garment. If there's any little pleats to apply it to a cuff, you want to do that. While it's still an independent piece and still flat. So now we have our sleeves prepared. We're going to put the sleeves in while the garment's in the flat. What, you say, if you're new? Then again, go look at that shirt sew along. I'd say the easy shirt sew along or the everybody shirt sew along. And it will uh, make all of that make so much more sense. So now our shirt is almost done. We are going to sew the underarm and side seam. So our underarm is underneath our arm, obviously. The sleeve is being closed up. At the same time, we continue right down the side seam. Now the garment is almost done. We're going to apply cuffs, top stitching, and a hem. Of course, obviously buttons and buttonholes. Now some of you may put buttons and buttonholes in sooner. I never do. And the reason is anything could get skewed in the sewing. A little less than you need up here, a little more. Something could get skewed. So I put my buttonholes and buttons in last. I also don't mark my buttonholes on my pattern. So if you purchase a shirt pattern from me, you're not going to likely see buttonholes. I don't think we did any that we put them on. Because we do it on a measuring system, and the best part of that, and again, I invite you to look at the sew along, is that we chalk a line straight down the center front because that's where your buttonholes go, is on the center front line. By chalking that line after everything is constructed, we know it's exactly where it's supposed to be. It won't get skewed one way or the other. And we also now know that every, if we put our buttonholes on that line, every single buttonhole will be in line. 
and you really want that for a good looking garment. So that's the order of construction for making a shirt. I might need to take a breath and see if anybody has any <laughs> questions. We don't have any questions so far, but if you do, please put them in the comments. Um, CND said, though, I use your order of construction on all patterns. It makes everything easier and faster. Oh, thanks, Sandy. <laughs> um, and then Polly had a funny story. She, um, in regards to like the, how you're talking about the dresses, she said, many years ago, my grandmother was helping me with making a dress. As she read the pattern and saw that it had us put the zipper in at the end, she said, and I quote, that is the stupidest thing I have ever seen. She said, that was probably 60 years ago, and I remember it vividly. And there's probably still patterns at your local Joann's that you pull out of the drawer that still do it that way. So just know, when you get a pattern, take a look at it. Now, I know there are people, and bless your hearts, that read a pattern guide from beginning to end before they ever start. I have never done that. I'm the kind of person who doesn't read the directions. Until I have to. <laughs> Until I hit a spot where I can't figure it out. But I also was taught to sew without directions, just because my... Uh, my father's mother, my grandmother, taught me to sew. And she learned to sew when there weren't any directions. Because guess what, ladies and gentlemen? There haven't always been pattern-making directions. Because back at the turn of the last century, not this one, people didn't have patterns. They had, sometimes, it started out, they would print some in the newspaper. Sometimes, like, those would be small craft projects or quilting projects. But even if you were able to get a pattern, that's all you got was the pattern. For those of you who are fans of Marfi patterns, they're Italian, you don't get any directions. You get the pattern pieces. That's it. Because those are people who never were involved in having instructions. They just were taught to follow a certain order of construction and all garments have pretty much very similar pieces. There is occasion where there's gonna be an unusual, like those things where they it looks like a twist and a knot in the front or some real unusual tucking and pleating that you're probably gonna need those directions because they've done it in a certain way that maybe you just never experienced. Um, so, uh, but I think that's great to hear that other people have found that to be foolish. But zippers are one of the things that are the most annoying for a lot of people. And unfortunately, again, it's because of the techniques. Right. If you open up that zipper package, and you'll see there's some nice little instructions in there. It's on a nice little card. Throw it away because it is the worst directions, the worst way to put a zipper in. You want to know how to put a zipper in? Did we do that on... I think I have a quick 90 second video I'm putting in a slot zipper. But yeah, those but of you- we have easy zippers. Yeah, we do have it on D, on USB. Five types of zippers you can put in without any pins or basting, which is all the types of zippers really. Um, so anyway- uh, I do have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, Jennifer asks, when do you do the darts? Oh, you would do the darts first, but in a sh I hadn't got to that yet because I'm gonna do a dress next. But you don't have darts in a shirt, so I didn't mention that. Um, of course, you would do all of your interfacing in advance of uh, preparing to sew. And we've talked about that before, too. Especially now that we use almost exclusively fusible interfacings, it's important that they have a time to cool and cure. And sometimes when we're in the throes of construction, we're just going to heat it on and take it to the machine and start sewing. It's not always the best. Uh, so... To save yourself from that, do all your interfacing in advance. Okay, I have a question for Beth Ann, and she is new to making clothes. Okay, so hi she, Beth Ann. She says, um, I agree with that, marking the buttons and buttonholes, but I did a shirt and put the buttonhole on the wrong cuff. How do I work to make sure I get it right? Okay, so she put, I'm assuming she means she put the buttonhole on the wrong side of the cuff. So your cuff 
overlaps on the outside of your arm. So that's one thing to always remember. And the top of the cuff, the cuff that part that's going to overlap is where the buttonhole goes. And um, I'll tell you this story real quick because I know I've told it before, but the first time I did a, a major fashion show in Las Vegas for a trade show, there were several other pattern designers and myself that were doing this. And my seamstress was having some trouble and she kind of put this shirt together at the last minute, actually brought it to me as I'm on the way to the airport. And she's always done such an excellent job. I get to Las Vegas and she has put the button, she has put them on backwards. So she has the buttonhole underneath. So now the cuff's going to overlap this way if you want to button it. And I'm thinking, now what am I going to do? I don't have a sewing machine. I can't rip these off and put them on the other way. What am I going to do? So I went to this fabulous uh, male model they had assigned me. And I said, okay, when you put this shirt on, you're going to notice that the cuffs are backwards. Just act like nothing's wrong and just go out there and come. Nobody noticed. But I was so embarrassed because all these other pattern designers were there. And I think of that, all the places. Of all the places all the time. So that's it. It's always remember that that cuff. The other thing to remember is when you're uh when the sleeve is open, the back of the sleeve is the smallest part. So let me explain that real, real quick, because that's the thing I always say in my classes to help people remember that the back, um, let me get a marker. So um, you've got your sleeve like this, and there's a, a split right here. Oh, this is so bad. Okay, so you've got a split. <laughs> this is where your lap is going to go. This is always the back. This will be the back, the shortest. So as you go to do any of this, and then you're going to have pleats probably, and those pleats will fold toward the back as well. So if you keep all that orientation in your mind, when you go to put that cuff on, you won't have, uh, won't make that mistake as easily. <laughs> You still might make that mistake because we all do make silly, simple mistakes. Yes. Okay. Um, Jen is asking, I believe these steps assume you already have the sizing accurate with a muslin. Oh, yes, I would hope so. This is just construction. I'm not teaching a all-encompassing sewing class right now. And obviously here at Islander, we do... Um, think it's necessary to make a muslin the first time you make a garment and particularly for those of us who are over a certain age because our bodies have changed and things are not accurate to a the way a pattern a commercial pattern has been designed because commercial patterns are not designed for rounded backs or uneven shoulders or uh, hips they're just not so you've got to make some of those adjustments and you can do that when you do a muslin and for those of you who are new playlist we have all a woven bodice fitting class on the playlist and we also have um one for knits but sherry has a good question sherry gregory um would there ever be a reason to put the sleeves after the side is sewn up yes there would be a time when you put the sleeves in but it's a very rare occasion if I'm working with a wool boucle, if I'm doing a high, high cap, which those high caps, you can tell the difference between a high cap and a flat cap, whoops, because it is higher. So, oh my, I don't have any more paper. <laughs> um, Just take those off. They're too tough. Oh, right? Yeah. But not this one. This one? This one. Okay. Oh, by the way, just in case, this is a shirt waist dress. Shirt waist dress. Looks like a shirt on the top, a uh, skirt on the bottom. I have had several comments recently, I don't know why, where people, 
are referring to shirtwaist dress, but they're really not. They're referring to a sheath dress, thinking because it has sleeves and a collar, it's a shirtwaist. So just remember, shirtwaist is shirt to the waist. Okay, so what I'm saying is, this is a flat cap sleeve, okay? This is a high cap sleeve. This is going to have a whole lot more gathering and easing needed. And it's a, um, it just needs a little more finessing. So that one I would put in on the round. Let's say I'm making a chenille style or Chanel style jacket. That's when I'm going to put the sleeve in because it needs to have that beautiful round shape. And when you're working with fabrics like wool, they're very moldable which is great unless they get molded in the wrong shape. So by having that rounded area to work with and putting that sleeve on there, that's when I would take that kind of fussy time to make a beautiful wool suit, something that's going to last you 25 years. But for your everyday quick uh, jacket or a uh, blouse or something, it's especially if it's in a woven cotton or something similar it's just not necessary it's a lot of work and there's no appreciable result okay, a couple more questions but i do want to share darlene's comment because i know that you can relate okay she said my grandmother was a seamstress and taught me to sew using this method she also taught me to measure the fabric requirements precisely. I had my first sewing class in home ec and almost flunked the class as the teacher wouldn't believe I would require less fabric and could construct the blouse using the flat technique. <laughs> that is so silly because in most patterns I found, and that shows you, you know, home ec teachers bless their hearts, but they're usually, especially back when I took home ec, they weren't so seamstresses. They learned a little bit about cooking, a little bit about economics, a little bit about sewing. They knew a little bit about it, but they didn't know a lot. And if she is really a seamstress, she would have found out that all those times the pattern told her to buy two and a half yards, she only used two and a quarter. So I found that out. I w I'm almost always could get whatever garment I was making out of a quarter to a third of a yard less than what was required. But I never bought less fabric because I always knew there was that moment where you cut something wrong or you made a mistake and cut it in a bad place and you had to replace it. So I always uh, went with what the pattern said, but it always does. And we do too. We give you a little bit extra because we know that anything uh, could change so Monique wants a clarification just to make sure she's understanding. So the sleeve is sewn flat before the front and back are already attached. No. That's what's well, her question. Oh, I don't. Not my question. Okay. No, 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 no. Remember, we put the shoulder seams in. We put the back and the yoke together. We did what we needed to with the fronts. Then we put the shoulder seam in. Chances are we applied top stitching that's when we put the sleeve in and you will be amazed that we put it in without any pins or basting and it comes out perfect every time so go look at everybody's shirt sew along and go to the sleeve section and you will see how we did it any of these th any of this construction you'll be able to see in any of those playlist videos. Yeah, and Phyllis says it's easy to sew the sleeve in flat. You can distribute the ease easier. Yes. Ease easier. And you don't get little uh, tucks, and it doesn't look like it's gathered and rippled. It just looks like it should. <laughs> oh, Karen got a book on the live sale last week, and she's loving it. She says... Um, she's learned so much already. I was able to use the seam matching for plaids this weekend already so Excellent. glad so glad you got it and are using it i did Learning. get somebody else say that about plaids this week too and we also have that in our tips and techniques you'll see just a quick little primer on how to cut plaids but i will tell you that we match plaids here without using pins or basting in a lot of cases like with the flannels they are these are not your soft flimsy flannels these are nice firm flannels 
and we can match the plaids uh, every time, plaids and checks on those without any pins or basing. Got to cut it right, but if you cut it right and you understand how to hold the fabric as you're feeding it in, it's just that easy. And it's not some kind of mm, years and years of, te of learning to get to it. It's just one or two sleeves and you're on your way. Um, Curtis says... Um, I'm just taking up sewing again since the mid 1990s. So glad I found this system back then. So I never developed any bad habits. Okay. Um, I feel like you are a dear aunt teaching me all of her tricks and tips. Um, and I wanted to make that comment because there were a couple other people who said similar about how sometimes those pattern guides can teach you bad habits or like you said, the zipper. Yeah. Sometimes, um, it just because it seems like they are the authority, it's not necessarily the right way. So it's okay to look for other ways from a credible source. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if it makes sense, it makes sense. Okay. So like you can go on YouTube and you can say, put in a zipper and you get everything, including a young lady who uses scotch tape to hold it in place. You get all kinds of things. Well, yeah, in the end, they finally get the zipper in, but it's, it's not scientific. It's not always repeatable. It's not good practice. You don't need glue. You don't need tape and you don't need pins. And they do it every day, thousands and thousands of times every day in the factory. And they don't have a special machine or anything different than what you have. It's a straight stitch machine. Sure. It sews a little bit faster, but, um, yeah, it just is, uh, it's too bad. You would think that the somebody like YKK, and I'm not picking on YKK, but a zipper manufacturer has been manufacturing zippers since the beginning of the zipper would have the best directions for putting a zipper in, and they don't. Okay, Holly, thank you for asking. Didn't mean to be rude. Um, she's like, what book are you referring to? Oh, sorry. Yes. So I did um, put it in the comments for you, but it's the Islander Sewing Systems One book. That has all the um, basis for the system and how to sew without pins or, or base. basting. And Holly, you will find that on the book page, but what you'll also notice is that you can purchase the companion DVD or USB. And on the DVD or USB, that's Margaret. And Margaret was the originator of the system, Margaret Islander. That's why it's called Islander Sewing Systems. And Margaret was my aunt. So she did the, the videos. Then when I uh, purchased the business, as she began to retire, I put the book together because there were a lot of people asked would prefer a book or would like a book companion. So you can buy the two together or you can buy them separately. Okay, okay. We're going to move on. I think okay. I got most everybody, um, All right. especially related to the topic, but we're going to move on. Any additional questions that you have or we might not get to, please email us, islandersewing at comcast.net. Okay, great. So, you know, an ad address is going to be similar to a shirt, but I just wanted to address the dress. So, um, and we're going to talk about a dress with a center back seam. So this is where you put the darts in first. And I think almost every pattern guy puts the darts in first anyway. Okay. So put the darts in first. And of course, this is after you made a muslin so that you know the darts pointing to the right place. Because we all know the dart should be about one inch from the apex and it should be pointing directly at the apex if it's a bust dart. Okay, whether it's coming from here or here or down here, all needs to point to the area that we're trying to uh, manipulate around or uh, mold around. Okay, so then we're going to do the sh shoulder seams. And then we're going to, well, let me see. Before I did the shoulder seams, I would sew the skirt backs to the bodice. Now we know there's a seam right down the center of the back. So we're going to take those two backs. Then we're going to add our skirts to those two backs. Then we're going to put the zipper in the back. Now we're ready to put the shoulder seams on. 
and continue as we did with the shirt. It's the same thing. Hey, was there a pocket on that dress? We put the pocket on first. Um, after we insert the zipper and put the shoulder seams, then we're going to do any necklines finish because it's still flat. So if I want to put a finish on here, whether it's a fold over finish, a binding or a facing or a lining, I want to do that so I can lay it all out nice and flat and I can spin that around as I'm sewing because I'll get the most perfect even curved stitches. For those of you who sew with a sewing machine set up on a table and you only have a bed this wide, you uh, are already set up for failure. You need an extension table or um, your machine sunk, better yet, sunk into a cabinet. And there's lots of opportunities to do that that are range from almost nothing to several, a couple thousand dollars. You can go in any direction you'd like. You can make a cabinet out of an old piece of furniture. You can buy an inexpensive cabinet from, there's a really good company called Arrow Cabinets, and they have a nice uh, economical line where you can go to some of the big guys and get the real expensive, beautiful pieces of furniture as a cabinet. But it doesn't matter. As long as you have a nice flat surface and you're not trying to sew up and over that tiny little bed. Setting you up for more failure than even using pins. Um, okay, so we finished the neckline. Now we put the sleeves in. Underarm seam and hem. It's just that easy. Now, is there any questions on the dress situation? If you had a zipper on the underarm, then you're going to put that in while it's still in the flat. Same, same. Same, same. Same, same. Okay, so I'm going to move on to pants now. If you have a question about dresses, feel free to, to throw it out, and um, we can circle back. Okay, so pants. And it was funny because as we were going over this in our meeting, Brenda said, you have pants on there, but you don't have anything underneath it. It's because you can't put pants together the wrong way. <laughs> it's just, there's Well, all... somebody can, but they can't be helped. Yeah, and if they put them <laughs> together the wrong, the, not in the wrong order. You can't put them together in the wrong order. I suppose you could put them together the wrong way, but then you'd have the crotch seams on the outside or something to be weird. So some people will say to me in class, well, now I had one teacher who told me to sew up the side seams, then um, the center seams, and then the, uh, the inside seam. Is that right? It's not wrong. Oh, another one will say, well, my teacher said sew up the, each leg separately, put one leg inside the other, and do that crotch seam. I like doing it that way. It's not wrong. It's not bad. Then you put a waistband on. If you had darts, you'd have put those in first. So the really, if you had pockets, when would you put the pockets on? First. So if we had those patch pockets, put that on first. If we had a inseam pocket, we'd get that going first before it was in the round. It's just really, once you get a hold of this idea, it's really, really simple. And you won't let some poorly written pattern guide send you down the wrong uh, trail and find that you've got to put a zipper in an evening gown that's already completely constructed. <laughs> You're trying to figure out how do I get it inside yeah. out and all that craziness. Not pop the sequins off. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And I know that happens because some people are so fixated, they're just only looking at step one and only looking at step two, and then all of a sudden they get to step 50 and they go, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so pants, you can't do it wrong. Pants are the most difficult garment to fit. And we have a fabulous system on fitting pants. It's called Pants Etc. And where you take your own measurements and you end up creating a sloper. That sloper can be turned into a pant pattern or it can be used to confirm that any pant pattern that you buy is actually going to be the right shape for your waist, hips, and the right length and shape for your crotch. Those are the places that you have to fit a pant. But uh, I'm not here to talk about pant fitting, although I have a lot to say. <laughs> um, we do have support materials on that DVD, USB, and book. Um, we also have a measurement chart 
that if you're going to do that, you want to download that measurement chart. Okay, so that's it. I don't know. I think this covers the basics for garments and everything else will fall in the same line. And basically it's about putting those sleeves in in the flat, putting the zipper on as soon as you can and following that order. Um, Diane asks, uh, I take it linings are the same order, but what about attaching the lining to the outside? So you want to attach the lining to the, uh, to the fashion fabric. So um, in the case of the dress, we're going to do that when we do that finishing of the neckline. So we did the darts. We did the um, backs. We put the zipper in. And then we did the shoulder seam. This is where we're going to attach it at the neckline. So if a lining is going to be attached at the neckline, you'll have the lining constructed. You'll put it there. And then it'll create that uh, turned under edge on the neckline. If you're like doing a sheath, okay? Um, if you're doing a jacket and you're lining it, that all happens completely separate at the very end. It's the last step. Now, if you look at my jacket pattern that is lined, which is the Motor City jacket, which is a motorcycle style jacket, we did the industry standard lining. You're gonna construct the lining, you're gonna construct the jacket, and then you're going to put them all together and they're, you can't even tell where it's been closed up. So there's no hand stitching either. It's all done by machine. It's called bagging the lining. So you can find that information in the Jacket Express. And I know some of you have taken the Craftsy class. Not the Jacket Express, I'm sorry. The Motor City Express. And some of you have taken the Craftsy classes. That's where you'll learn about putting that kind of lining in. But that's all done completely constructed completely separately put together at the last minute the last thing darla wants to know if the islander book we're talking about has the order of construction information in it no no it doesn't no and you know this is it what i mean if you want to watch this back and write the order of construction down um you can do that but I'm telling you, you won't need those notes very long after you've constructed one or two garments. It's just like, it's just common sense. It's just that we were all taught to follow the rules. And I find that women are the biggest culprits at following the rules. Jessica, she always wants to follow the directions. And even when she was younger and I was teaching her, she'd be going, but it says to do this. I'm like, but I told you, do this. And we would have a little scuffle because... She wants to do it right, and she wants to follow the directions. So um, you won't be that person anymore. You'll say, no, I'm putting this well, in Well, it's also first. about starting to understand it, too. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. when I'm saying she can see it all in her head, she could, could see it all, how it's going to go together and how difficult it's going to be to put the zipper in at the end. <laughs> and I'm like, but the directions say this. They must know what they're talking about. And she can see that it's not. And I couldn't see that yet. Yeah. And you know what? That brings up, and if you don't mind, I'm just going to go aside for a second. Because we, Do I, we have a choice. No. Okay. We had a conversation uh, at lunch today. And um, I was explaining to Jess. She said, well, why are the, imp why is the directions? Why are they wrong? I feel like it was a good question. Yeah. I Well, I think it was. Because, for your guys' sake, yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the reason. Everything that you know about sewing and home came from, let's call it the umbrella of home sewing. The umbrella of home sewing came from all those women, all those ancestors of ours who to have garments had to sew. Sewing was a necessity. It was something that every good housewife knew how to do. She knew how to sew. So it was handed down from several different, I know how to sew people. So Grandma Bates in California taught her kids to do it this way. Grandma Smith in New Hampshire, similar, but not the same. But it's all home sewing. 
So then when they came about to have college uh, classes for sewing, and some of those would be home deck, some of them are fa actually called fashion design classes. Again, everything came from home sewing. All the books, all the teachers, all the techniques were home sewing. The, be the best, the most, not the best, the most popular pattern drafting book that was used in colleges for over 25 years has a lot of dead wrong things in it, but it came from home sewing. So I'm going to just go one more step and tell you about my friend Connie Crawford, whose products we sell. Connie's retired now, but she was a college graduate in fashion design and she became a professor. To supplement her income, she went to work in the garment factory, in a garment factory for a special designer. And she was considered what's called the first pattern maker. So the designer gives you a sketch, you draft the pattern, and then they test it out. Well, the first pattern she made, the boss came in and chewed her out. Why did he chew her out? Because she didn't balance the pattern. So she very cleverly said, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know I was supposed to do that. And he said, okay, get it done. And he left the room. And then she turned to the other people in the room and said, what does that mean? She had never been taught to balance a pattern. That's abhorrent. That is so bad because if you don't balance a pattern, you're going to have seams that shift to the back, seams that hang all kind of wonky sleeves that don't sit in the arm side right. It has to be balanced. And so again, home sewing didn't know that. So for generation after generation, even those who thought they were being taught professional techniques were being taught home sewing methods. So when Connie came along, she learned that about drafting. It's a similar experience with Margaret in construction. Learned home sewing construction, was excellent at it, was a super seamstress right off the bat. She had the aptitude for it. But then she went to L.A. and worked in a, uh, a training center for the garment factory and went, oh my gosh, who knew it was this easy? So she began to transfer that information into classes to teach home sewers so they could have more fun and a more efficient project. Did I go far enough off track? Sorry. <laughs> but anyways well, I think it is I mean I did ask the question but I think it is important because you always teach the why not just do this so you think that these pattern companies would know the best way to do it and this is the best way they know how maybe or it's set up that way after all this time or whatever um, so it's good to know why it might be like that and why I'm tell you're telling them that it's okay to do differently and I have another good question from Sherry. Can you talk about hems? When would you sew in the round at the end and when would you sew the pieces separately when flat for a hem? I wouldn't sew them separately for a hem because a skirt is in the round, a shirt is in the round even though it overlaps in the front or a dress might be. But I would always put that hem in last um, there is an occasion on a knit t-shirt where we put the hem in the sleeve first before we sew it. And the reason is, is this is, would be the sleeve. This is a very narrow opening, sorry Jess, on this three quarter inch sleeve. And it's difficult to get that in and do a nice cover hem stitch on it. So that's one place where we'll take a little creative license and we'll do it first and then we'll sew the side seam or the underarm seam up. But then it's you got to be spot on to get those edges flush. Otherwise, it's obvious. And uh, But I wouldn't do it under any other circumstance. It's just a t-shirt and it's complicated to do it the other way. So, okay, I can live with it. It's under my arm. I can live with it. There are situations where that same type of concept is used, but it cheapens the garment. So, no, I almost always. One, another thing on hems, though, Sherry, and you'll know if you've, and I think you have made our Islander shirt, 
sometimes we will press the hem up and create a creased hem before we construct it in the round. Then when we go to put the hem up, everything's already pressed up and we can just put the hem in. That's easier than trying to press it in the round depending on the garment. All right, we barely have any time. We showed him, told him we were going to show this flannel. So does okay. anyone have one that they want to see? That they... I forgot to say one thing. No, while they're forgot to say On the pants, there's no such thing as directional sewing. So if you have been taught to sew up one side and down the other, or up both sides or down both sides, give it up. It doesn't matter. As long as you match every notch, as they come out even at both ends, I don't care if you... Which way? Up, down, doesn't matter. But I know a lot of people were taught that, so I wanted to make sure and get that out. And, okay, did they say which ones they want to see? I didn't hear anything yet, but okay. I wasn't waiting. All right. So I'm going to start with this one. Okay. Yeah, this is gorgeous, and it's quite complex. I don't know if the camera picks it up, but the... Photographs, especially when you see one of our fabrics, be sure if you want to know more or see more about it, if you click on it, it's going to take you to a separate page where you can enlarge it and really see uh, the detail and the coloring. And again, for those of you who are new, you're going to notice something very unusual with our fabric swatches. There's going to be a Crayola crayon or two sitting on that swatch. And the reason is, is that uh, about two years ago or a year and a half, I don't remember, a while back, we decided this would be the easiest way for the average person to be able to tell the color. Because we all know the monitors do, of your computer doesn't show the color the same as mine. So we got a box of the 96 Crayola crayons, a new box, and we used those crayons to identify the color. So if you have that box of crayons, which we highly suggest, it's about $5 at your local Meyer, Walmart, whatever, you can look at that crayon and you can say, yes, that's exactly the color of blue I wanted. Or, nope, that's not the right shade. Move to the next one. All right. So this one I love. It's your typical plaid, but then it's got the brown in it. It's a little bit different. Give it some dimension. All right, mm -hmm. Sharon wants to know, do you have any flannel that is a little heavier to make a shacket? Well, <laughs> let me tell you. We, um, this flannel is a nice mid-weight. You can make a ja jacket out of this one. And as a matter of fact, mm, stay tuned next month. <laughs> um, Did you want anything? But my grandsons use theirs that I made of this as jackets. They do not use it as a button up shirt because apparently in the teenage world of America, button up shirts that aren't jackets aren't cool anymore. You got to have it as open and with a t shirt underneath. Then you're cool. So, of course, my grandkids have to be cool. This one, very nice. It's a lighter blue. It's got the little bit of red going through it. The gray, the white. Yeah, you pick what you want to show. Mm -hmm. What are you looking for? Well, I just think um, there's lots of opportunities out there and there's a big trend right now in mixing prints and plaids, mixing plaids a lot, especially with the jackets. So we've got a lot that you could do that with. And I love this one because if you're not into all the, mm, uh, the, the volume of plaid, the, uh, multicolor. This is a beautiful red plaid, but it's all monochromatic. So I think this is kind of a nice alternative 
for those who maybe aren't as big of a plaid fans. But you can mix it with any, there's so many, we try to stick with, we try to stick with uh, reds and blue combinations so that you'd have lots to mix and match. But here's another way to mix and match. But there's quite a few of the red and gray and black. There's quite a few of the black, I mean the blue and black. And there's even, you can combine the two. We've even got some bright blue and red that back one back there is real pretty. So take a look on the website. And Jessica's telling me we need to wrap it up. So um, any questions that you might have about order of construction, about what we talked about today, or any sewing conundrums that you might be having, just contact me. I'm at islandersewing at comcast.net. Islander Sewing at Comcast.net. Um, sometimes you'll write your questions in the comments for me, and I don't always see those. Sometimes I miss them. So send me a direct email, and you know you're going to hear back from me. Yep. Marcy, did you see the one you wanted to see? She was at the bottom one on the table, but now they're not there. <laughs> oh. um, so it might have been one of the ones you pulled. I'm not sure. So I'll give it a second. I think. Okay, which one, Marcy? We'll grab it real quick. Is this it? Oh, U11. I don't know what that means. Oh, go pull up the yeah. website. Red, teal, and black. Red, teal, and black. Is that that one down there? Nope. It's like that. Different. <laughs> maybe, maybe it is. Let's get that one. Is it's it big? Black, though. Um, this one. Yeah. yeah, I know. That's well. Here, see. Yeah, that's it. Yes, oh. and that's why we use the crayons. She, it was reading black on Jessica's monitor instead of teal, but. Well, it says red, teal, and black. Yeah. But the picture is much darker. Than the in person. Here, let me open it up for her. Oh, I no, actually, it is closer than it looks. It just doesn't have in the picture. Hold on, let me get to my. <laughs> it doesn't in the picture. It doesn't show this portion, so that's where I was getting thrown off. But yeah, this one very, very, very nice. Yeah, this one's my favorite. I think I'm thinking about using this one for myself, but I don't know hard to decide when you have so many to choose from okay all right so get those while we still have them um, there's lots that you can do with those they're super I mean if you've been to any store like I am talking any store from Walmart to Saks mm -hmm. <laughs> has all everything the flannel out right now mm -hmm. so you can't go wrong and, we'll and they've got them um, all the same mismatched the same colorway mismatched different completely colors. different colors colorways. that don't even have anything in common you can go whatever way you yep. want and if you want to do some of these for christmas gifts or something stay tuned next uh, month we've got some exciting news and we'll show you some little tricks and tips all right so like janet said um any questions islander sewing at comcast.net and we will get back to you, and otherwise we'll see you at the first week of November, Tuesday yeah. at 2. First Tuesday. Don't forget, you newbies, be sure to like us here, follow us, and subscribe on our YouTube channel so you'll uh, be here to hear about all the great stuff that we're going to do. We're Islander Sewing Systems. I'm Janet Prey. This is Jessica Johnson. And we've had a great time today. We hope you did, too. Have a wonderful week. Bye now.